Good evening, and welcome to this edition of Labor Vision. This evening's show is part of our Legislative Issues series hosted by Jim Parisi. I'm Bob Delaney, Executive Director of the Institute for Labor Studies and Research. Labor Vision, a production of the Institute, focuses on topics of importance to working Rhode Islanders. We hope you enjoy this evening's edition. Thank you for joining us for this evening's edition of Labor Vision, where we bring the General Assembly into your living room. My name is James Parisi. I'm a field representative with the Rhode Island Federation of Teachers and Health Professionals, and I'm your host this evening. Today we're going to talk about Labor's agenda for the 2013 year. The General Assembly is just getting going, and we want to outline what Labor is going to be working on. And joining us are the two people who lead the Rhode Island Labor Movement, George Nee. George, thanks for joining us. Oh, glad to be here, Jim. Yeah, okay. George, you're the president of the Rhode Island AFL-CAO, and you're also the head of Working Rhode Island. The that's, Labor what they, that's what they tell me. <laughs> <laughs> and Maureen, Maureen, you've been on the show a few times. Uh, Maureen Martin is secretary treasurer of the Rhode Island AFL-CIO, and probably more importantly, you're my colleague. Uh, it's important to me. <laughs> it is. Um, Maureen, you've been on the show before, but uh, George, this is your first time. So George, I, I always like having people talk a little bit about their own background before we get into the issues. How long have you been working for the labor movement? Uh, I've been working in the labor movement since 1976 when I um, started an independent union called the Rhode Island Workers Union, which then affiliated with the Service Employees Union in 1979. And then Ed McElroy, who was the president of the Rhode Island AFL-CIO at the time, hired me as a staff person to go to work for the Rhode Island AFL-CIO in 1983. Um, actually, my first involvement in the labor movement goes back to 1967, when I was a member of the Labor's Union uh, in Syracuse, New York. Mm -hmm. As okay. a construction worker. That absolutely certainly counts as well. <laughs> and, and I also know that you have a background with uh, the farm workers. I uh, actually uh, left school in uh, 1970 and I went to work for the United Farm Workers Union. Uh, I was a bodyguard for Cesar Chavez out in California during the uh, Thousand Mile March when the law was passed in 1975. And actually it's thanks to the farm workers that I came to Rhode Island. They sent me to Rhode Island in 1971 to run the lettuce boycott, uh, which was right after the grape boycott. And uh, I joke with the guy that sent me there, uh, Marcos Munoz, I said, Marcos, you never called me back, so I stayed here. So I'm still <laughs> waiting for a call back, but I don't think I'm going back now. All right, uh, you started working um, for the AFL-CIO 30 years ago. Have you been going to the State House uh, all that time as well? I have, that was one of my first responsibilities. So I've been actually a full-time lobbyist for the AFL-CIO since 19, 83, but when I was with my uh, earlier union, the Service Employees Union and the Rhode Island Workers Union, I also lobbied on nursing home industry issues and other issues that affect our membership going back to 1976. Okay. Uh, why don't we just give the viewers a sense on, on who's represented by the AFL-CIO in Working Rhode Island. Maureen, um, you know, in, in terms of the AFL-CIO, who's, who's, a, who's a member of it? Who does the AFL-CIO represent in this state? So actually we don't have members more than we have affiliates. And um, we you know, have private sector labor unions and public sector and, uh, and anyone in between. Um, I'm not sure exactly the numbers at this point. I know we have an, a couple of new affiliates in the about, past about, year or so. Uh, about actually 80,000 people, mm -hmm. retirees and, and active members. Right. Okay. Right, but I'm not sure about the amount of uh, labor unions. Um, about 250. 250 now. That yeah, are affiliated so. with the state fed. Okay, 250 local unions. Local, local unions, That are correct. all part of the mm -hmm. Rhode Island AFL-CIO. Mm -hmm. Okay, and Working Rhode Island, a sponsor of this show, um, is another labor entity. How do you, how do you folks describe what the a Working Rhode Island is separate and apart from what the Rhode Island AFL-CIO is? Because I know there's a lot of overlap. Well, Working Rhode Island is sort of uh, I guess one of the goals or one of the dreams of the labor movement historically was one big union. 
So in Rhode Island, we have one big union. It's called Working Rhode Island, which uh, was created about six or seven, about seven years ago now. And it is a table where all of the different unions uh, in Rhode Island are welcome, whether or not they're part of the AFL sale or not. So in our current situation, we have uh, Carpenters Union, we have the uh, AAUP, the university professors, we have RIBCO, uh, the correctional officers, and UNAP, none of which are part of the AFL sale, but are a part of Working Rhode Island. So it's a, a place where the, there can be a voice for the whole labor movement where we try to cooperate on issues that are affecting the whole labor movement and provide as much solidarity as we can and try to get people to work together and um, you know, utilize the strength of that solidarity. Mm -hmm. So adding to the strength in Working Rhode Island, I think is, is um, or are the, the coalition with, with community organizations, sort of the non-labor but friends of ours, like Ocean State Action, Jobs with Justice, Fuezo, Fuezo Laboral and Rikosh, uh, which are the occupational mm -hmm. safety and health folks. And uh, so if you kind of combine them with the 80,000 strong uh, plus another probably 25,000 uh, non-AFL uh, labor union folks, it's uh, quite a force in Rhode Island. Yeah, considering the state's about one million, we've, about one we've million. got almost 10% affiliated with, yeah. with us yes. The directly. workforce is about yeah. 450, so it's yeah. actually, you know, we're still in Rhode Island, we still have a pretty good density. We're still around 20% of the labor force is mm -hmm. unionized, mm -hmm. which is certainly greater than a lot of, greater than the national average and greater than a lot of states. Yeah, by far. We've had several, if I could just pile on to that, um, uh, states around the nation who have inquired about the working Rhode Island and it has expanded George's I know going around and talked to some executive boards and national and state executive boards about the power of the people being strengthened yeah, I in think this way so it's been I, a great I observed concept. that around the country where other parts of the labor movement mm -hmm. were devolving we were we were getting more um, together and, mm -hmm. and, and exhibiting greater solidarity yeah. when we created Working Rhode Island years ago. Yeah, and I think it served us well when the Change to Win uh, initiative took place about five years ago now. There was a concern that that would split the labor movement and a number of major affiliates left the AFL-CIO at the national level. And in Rhode Island, uh, had no impact on us at all. We, we made a decision that, you know, if you guys want to fight at the national level, that's fine, just, you know, leave us alone, we'll continue to work with each other. You always call on us to get everything done at the local level, so you've got to have that solidarity at the local level. And one of the things we've done in the last two or three years is take the concept of working Rhode Island and move it to the local community level. So our vision now would be to have 39 labor movements in Rhode Island, one for each city and town where the activists could get together and exert their influence and strength at the local level to protect the interests of the workers in that community. And so we've now probably got seven or eight communities where they're involved in the local issues, whether school committee issues or city council issues, zoning issues, and we're you know, bringing together those people who share a two common things. One, they live in the same community, and secondly, they're a union member. Sure. So that's how we're gonna rebuild this labor movement from the bottom up. There you go. Before we talk about the 2013 legislative agenda for the labor movement, why don't, why don't we get a um, 2012 uh, two or three minute recap. What were, were the highlights of the last legislative session as far as the labor movement's concerned? Well, I think that um, the fact that we moved marriage equality, the conversation about that so much further down the road and that we'll be addressing it this year, I think was pretty memorable for last year's work that we did, not that um, we were hugely successful, but we moved the conversation down the road to a great extent, and I think that labor being involved in the conversation as of last year and somewhat the year before, I think was, uh, was something to be looked at in a real positive light. Mm -hmm. We also were able to um, get an increase in the minimum wage from $7.40 an hour to seven seventy-five, which just took place uh, January 1st. We made significant progress on a long-standing issue of the misclassification mm -hmm. of workers by employers. What they do is, in order to avoid paying taxes, whether it be state taxes, unemployment insurance, workers' comp, et cetera, 
they very selfishly describe their employees as independent contractors. So what they're doing by that is they are, they're cheating the employee, they're cheating the tax system, and they're cheating the good employers. So we made some significant progress last year in increasing the enforcement on that, increasing the penalties. We still need a stronger definition of what is an independent contractor versus what is a, uh, uh, an employee. Um, we're very happy to see that the uh, educational formula was accelerated by an extra year, so that provided more money to our, our school systems and for the uh, teachers and the support staff. Um, we were also particularly in some of the urban it, areas, it, it, which yeah, are so, really in financial well, because distress. the new formula, I think, <clears throat> weighted more for those communities, as far as I understand, right. which is a positive thing. Um, we also were successful in. Um, I think have the heart program is certainly something worth mentioning. Oh, the, the res that, restoration uh, of the DD funds, yes. Yes, well, about 40% of the money that was taken from the DD budget, uh, de developmental disabilities, where we provide uh, services for folks in the community with developmental disabilities. And um, although it was, it fell short of uh, what we were looking for to restore the money that was taken from, from uh, the community the year before, I think it was a huge success, success that, mm -hmm. that we, will be, we were able to, uh, to get back into the budget. Yeah. We were also uh, successful in stopping the governor's initiative on the municipal pension issue. Um, it was bad enough what happened in 2011 uh, in, on the pension issue for the state employees and the teachers, but the governor was taking it to another level by basically uh, coming in and trying to undermine the collective bargaining process. At the municipal level, most of the pensions had been negotiated between different unions and their employer or the city or the town. Mm -hmm. His legislation would have undermined that and allowed the employer, in this case the cities and towns, to just arbitrarily and capriciously change pension benefits. And, and attempts were made to do that. Um, we were successful in stopping that legislation and it's, it was important because it has the issue was significant and that was asking the legislators to understand and respect the process of collective bargaining and see the difference between the two. Um, so I think that was a significant uh, victory for the labor movement. And also on the nursing home front, we were able to codify the COLA instead of having that to have to be a subject uh, every year to discussion and not make it mm -hmm. administrative. So, so, so there was, you know, all in all, it was certainly a better year than 2011, and we're hopefully we're we're we've reached the bottom and we're climbing. Okay, and and uh, certainly you had a, a good legislative year last year, and you had a pretty good election cycle this past November. So that sets the table for 2013. What what are the top priorities of the Rhode Island Labor Movement now that the 2013 session of the General Assembly is beginning? Take it away. Put well, on uh, the table. certainly we're going to be working um, a little harder on the minimum wage. As George said, we, we had it raised, but we need to get it indexed. Um, we can't wait like every five or six or seven years and raise it. I think that it's important to index it to some sort of rate, government rate, where we can uh, have a little kind of raise every year for folks who make the least amount of money in the state of Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. and, and um, we often hear that it's just a bunch of teenagers working minimum wage, and it's not, as um, we've seen the data, that these are working families who are two people working more than one job each because they're only making minimum wage, that uh, they're just trying to kind of codge it together uh, enough money to, to survive and raise their families. So I think the, uh, the work on that's gonna be pretty heavy this year. Sure. In fact, uh, we have a bill already introduced by uh, Senator Lynch and uh, uh, Representative uh, um, Warwick. No, um, Ferry? Okay, no. so we don't know. Well, yes, yeah, you remember. <laughs> uh, David, oh, Dave Bennett. David, David Bennett. David Bennett. Bennett. Uh, <laughs> to raise it to 825. Oh. We came across some very interesting information. 66% of the people who work for the minimum wage work in corporations over 100. So this is not a small business. This is a transfer of wealth issue. The hamburger in Connecticut costs the same as the hamburger in Rhode Island. 
The worker in Connecticut's making eight twenty-five. The worker in Rhode Island's making seven seventy-five. The worker in Massachusetts is making eight oh five. So we could look at this in a broader context now. If you take the large corporations that employ minimum wage workers, fast food, retail in particular, those are the two largest. Most of them are international and national corporations. So they're taking the money out of Rhode Island and sending it to another state or another country. So if we want to build up some wealth and bring it, build an economy from the bottom up, you know, raising the minimum wage does not hurt the local small business Rhode Island economy. It's taking money from the corporations that have all recovered from the recession. So just a way to look at it in a different context. Sure. And I've always found it interesting that while most union workers make well above the minimum wage, the labor movement's always taken a leadership role on this issue. Absolutely. Because it's just a matter of economic justice and what kind of an economy you're going to have. Because you've got to... If you're going to have a vibrant economy, you have to have people with money in their pocket. You know, all these corporations, all these people want everyone to buy their product, but they only want to put them out of work and send the job overseas or change the technology. So there'd be nobody working, and then they're complaining that nobody's mm -hmm. buying their products. Mm -hmm. You've got to have a balance. Sure. Got to give them some money to buy it. Mm -hmm. I think, Jim, we're going to be having some lively conversations this year about contract continuation for teachers and public employees um, or some contract resolution solution. Um, you know that um, the General Assembly I read, I think in the Providence Journal today, actually work under their old rules uh, from the previous year when you're in the, um, the House of Representatives or in the Senate chambers. They work, until they make a resolution to change it, they work under the old rules of their previous uh, legislative session and I think that we can expect no more for or no less for teachers and public employees to be able to um, when their contract with the state or the school committee uh, the school uh, district expires or the, the community that they would work under the old rules until a new contract is negotiated I don't think it's unreasonable I think that the chambers work under those very rules and it's something we could emulate Sure, and I know the Rhode Island Senate has passed both um, contract continuation as well as mm -hmm. other um, legislation on resolving unresolved teacher right. contracts. Mm -hmm. uh, we're waiting for some action on the House, I imagine. And that issue will be pursued vigorously. Um, also, a uh, couple of other issues that we've been probably will be involved in is the restoration of the historic tax credit in terms of a spur to economic development activity. However with a, uh, a provision that will protect the workers of the state, that it would be, be, uh, have a prevailing wage component to it. And it also should be narrowed so that it isn't helping, you know, uh, like the Hope Club, which the other one did. This should be taking abandoned properties that are presently not off the tax, on the, on the tax, tax roll and bringing them onto the tax roll so it'll help the city and town mm -hmm. in addition to creating employment opportunities. And, uh, we're and all preserving historic buildings, and which is another historic social building, benefit. Which will, which will be good. And we, are, we will be pursuing, uh, I believe legislatively again, a, a clear definition of the difference between an independent contractor and an employee. Because this is a possible significant amount of money that could come into the General Assembly, into the general, I mean, revenues, if these cheats were stopped and, and the employers had to pay the taxes and That'll benefit not just the worker, but the good employers and also the economy. And it would help our state budget, which is exactly. continuously exactly. underfunded by getting some more revenue yep. coming in. Yeah, the other, other states that are, in fact, the sad thing is, is that this has been much heavily enforced in Connecticut and Massachusetts. So we're getting the renegade and uh, rat contractors that are coming into Rhode Island because they say, oh, they don't enforce it in Rhode Island, we'll go do business there. Mm -hmm. So, and we've even had situations where we've had uh, universities, the colleges and universities that, you know, we have supported them on bond issues for, and then they bring in contractors either out of state and that are cheating workers. So that just can't be tolerated any longer. Sure. I know I listened to the opening day speeches of the Senate President and the Speaker of the House, and, and everyone's talking about economic development, you know, what we can do to remedy the, the incredibly high unemployment rate in this state. What does the labor movement have to say about economic development um, and, and how does that relate to what you're going to be working on this year? Well, I think there's a couple things. Uh, I mentioned the historic tax preservation. I think that would help. The, the other, uh, there's a, an area that is still 
not, we're not there yet, and that is the, the activities related to the ports and maritime activities. We uh, were successful in getting, uh, through federal government, two new cr cranes at both Quonset and at uh, um, uh, Providence. There's a tremendous amount of economic development potential in Rhode Island with short sea shipping, with uh, the, the improvement in those ports and the marketing of those ports. And the General Assembly has had a commission for the last couple of years, uh, chaired by uh, uh, first Peter Kilmartin and now uh, Deborah Girio and also Senator Walaska. And if we could develop a coordination of the different ports that we have in Rhode Island, Providence, Quonset, East Providence, Galilee, and Newport, so that we're not competing, but we're looking at what are the opportunities to really enhance this activity, because that's something that other states don't have. We're sitting on a, on, a, on a real advantage for the people of Rhode Island. So that's something that we could do. We've also been calling on the uh, governor and the legislature to put general revenue money into the, our job training and workforce development system. We have a skills gap, we have all these issues and studies that we've done, it's clear. And we, and we have some terrific job training programs. We have a lot of opportunities to help people get into these jobs and it's completely uh, underfunded. In fact, not only do we not put any general revenue into our workforce development system, we take $2 million off the top and give it back to general revenue. So whether it's industry partnerships, uh, incumbent worker training, uh, training that's gone, that's a match between the employer and the employees, that would be an investment that would really make sense. And also I think that higher ed has completely been shortchanged over the last three or four years. You know, we talk about the critical nature of that and we defund it. So I don't know, we have to start matching up our rhetoric with reality. Our, our state is one of the worst in the whole country in funding yeah. its higher ed, public yeah. higher ed system. Yeah, and then we talk about how important it is. Well, you know, it is or it isn't. If it's important, we fund it. If it's not, we don't. Mm -hmm. So far, I'd have to say we don't think it's important. Right. And speaking of funding, um, I think uh, certainly one of, one of our priorities will be talking about tax equity this year. Um, without some more revenue coming in uh, by having everyone, you know, the, the, the rich amongst us, pay their fair share in taxes to support some, some programs that need to be either developed for workforce um, empowerment or the community services that we have in place now. Uh, I don't think we'll be able to move the state forward. So there are a lot of things, like oh, we, we mentioned the developmental disabilities money being put back, but really didn't even bring us up to where the developmental disability community needs to be um, to make them even from two years ago. So some money needs to get put into that. We have the uh, public transit system in the state of Rhode Island, which really relies heavily on the gasoline taxes. And in this day and age, with the gasoline co costing so much and people making so little, really fewer people are using cars and fewer people are buying gas and more people are riding the buses. But we don't have the ability, but you can see how it doesn't balance out, so we're not getting the revenue we need to support the bus system. So uh, w without that coming through, with some tax equity and some, some more money coming through, um, those kind of systems w will not survive sure. for the next few years. Tax equity being the idea that people who are wealthy ought to pay more in income taxes. I know uh, there was a high profile bill last year that would raise the rate 4% on those earning right. a quarter million or more. Um, is, this, are there gonna be a, is, is there gonna be a different look on, on tax equity this I think year? We're talking about 2% this year. And uh, we took out one of the complications last year that some of the legislators had was that we were going to tie the rate to, uh, help me out here, the, the, the unemployment, rate. unemployment rate. rate, that as the unemployment rate went down, so, uh, the, the, um, the tax rate would. And uh, so we took that out to kind of simplify the bill a little bit. And, uh, yeah, well, yeah. I think that, you know, we get into the tax issue, uh, the thing that kills people the most, I mean, where we're out of whack in the state is in our, compared to other states, is not the income tax. We're in the middle of the pack. Mm -hmm. We're in the middle of the pack on the sales tax, if you look at how much people actually spend mm -hmm. on sales tax because we have so many exemptions. Where we're totally 
out of whack. And unfortunately, first in the country is the property tax and the car tax. And so the car if you put tax. those two things mm -hmm. together, so that if you're really going to have tax equity, if we were really going to do this right, we would raise the taxes on the income tax. And we would certainly have a higher income rate for people above 250000 And then we would take that money and then we would invest it in a number of different things. And everybody's got their favorite thing. But we would also provide more money back to the cities and towns. The cities and towns mm -hmm. had approximately $100 million less given to them, starting with the Kachiri administration. And over the period of time, it was, a, in my judgment at least, a purposeful strategy on the part of that administration to really weaken the cities and towns and take away their funding source. They are constricted in how, they can, how much money they can raise. So if we're going to be fair, we should take the money from people who you know, are in a better position to, earn, to, to take it, whether they're earning income or whether they've got dividends and all this other stuff. And, and give some back some property tax relief to the cities and towns, and that includes the business community, because the businesses are also in those communities, mm -hmm. and they're being killed by the property mm -hmm. tax. So that's what equity would be. You know, that's why the co this coalition is for tax equity. It isn't just for raising taxes. It's for tax providing a, a system that mm -hmm. is more equitable mm -hmm. and can be more beneficial to the economy. I know that was a big coalition project that didn't pass last year that's going to get a lot of attention yes. this year. The other big project that was um, uh, unsuccessful last year but it's going to be hot again this year is marriage equality. And, and what is the labor movement's interest in marriage equality legislation that's been proposed? Well, we, um, the AF, Rhode Island AFL-CIO first took a position on marriage equality in 2011. Um, we began to, or we started to see it and eventually saw it as a issue of human rights, civil rights, and worker rights. There are a tremendous number of laws that apply to our members that, that, by, that, they, that they are covered by if they're married. Um, I'll give you an example. Workers' compensation. Um, if you, there is a death benefit that goes to the spouse. So if you're in a relationship even if it's a civil union relationship, and someone unfortunately dies on the job, you, you're, being de you're, you're being denied that basic benefit that would provide for another spouse in a, in a marriage situation. So there's, there's a tremendous number of laws, rules and regulations that would then be afforded to people. So it's a matter of equity. And you know, I, it, I just came from a press conference uh, from a coalition that has come together mm -hmm. for this marriage equality issue. And, you know, it, it's, it's very, very clear. When, it, no one's taking away rights from anybody. It's not like it's going to hurt anybody else. What we're talking about is providing the same basic rights to everybody. So, you know, it really is it's a, it's an issue of justice. Let me say that as, um, as a board member for Marriage Equality RI, um, <clears throat> I've really learned a lot. It's been a learning curve for me being involved in the group. And um, one of the things I'm really concerned about is youth who are involved in you know, whether they're uh, you know gay or lesbian, transsexual, and and uh, because I'm working in the education field, I really kind of looked at that little part of it, and I thought how sad it was. And as I testified last year, when we talk about how things are in school and bullying and all of the things that we worked on last year in the education field with the legislature, and um, and I think about how here we are as a state treating people differently because they're gay and, um, and how that transfers to children. K kids aren't dumb. They can say, oh, no, wait a minute, we really are. So if I'm, I'm a junior high school kid and I have the idea that, that uh, I'm a little different than everybody else, it's like I'm not really leading a full life. I can't really come out. I can't, I'm afraid. I'm afraid of being bullied. And I think that all of the work that we, we do around bullying and, and making people feel safe at school is um, kind of tied into this whole question about marriage equality. So I'd like to see some legislators address that issue. Mm -hmm. That's quite a list. I mean, we have tax equity, marriage equality, historic tax credits, you know, budget issues like the DD funding, contract continuation. Um, you, you've outlined a pretty ambitious agenda for the labor movement well, this year. You know, I, I, uh, we, one of the things I guess I resent the most is being referred to as a special interest. Because as you can see, as you just articulated, 
Um, we're not a special interest, we're the people's lobby. And uh, you know, we, we, are, we, we are involved in unemployment insurance, minimum wage, workers' compensation, health care, education, environmental issues, bond issues. You know, we're there in almost every facet of, of our community. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I mean, a special interest is, you know, a bank or an insurance company or a retail store or, I mean, and they're only interested in a tax break for them or how it's going to benefit their. What we do affects and impacts the lives of everybody, whether in, both in the workplace mm -hmm. or in the community. Mm -hmm. You know, unemployment and workers' comp are two very good examples. When we fight to improve those programs or, or protect those programs, that doesn't affect, there's no workers' compensation rate for union members and non-union members, they're all treated, it's all workers, they're all treated the same. Even as you mentioned the minimum wage, uh, you know, we've be hard been put. successful moving people out of poverty, moving, creating a middle class, but it's our obligation as a labor movement to fight and protect, and to improve the health care, the education, the well-being of everybody. So. I you think know. you would find about 90% of the stuff that we work on, perhaps more, really affects the broader community of Rhode Island, mm -hmm. not just uh, labor union members. Okay. Well, terrific. Well, we're out of time. I, I thank you both for your time today oh, outlining the agenda. And uh, we look forward to having future editions of Labor Vision where we bring some of the senators and representatives who introduced some of this legislation in to talk to us about how, how those issues are going in great detail. Thank you both very much. Thank, Thank you, you, Jim. Well, welcome again to uh, another uh, episode of uh, the history of American working people uh, in Rhode Island uh, and the world around us. Uh, my name is Scott Malloy. I'm a professor at uh, your state university, URI, and uh, it's uh, always fun to uh, uh, bring what I teach uh, in the classroom uh, to a wider audience whenever that's available. And certainly nothing could be more appropriate right now in American history than taking a look at the uh, uh, Great Depression. Although I have to say, uh, uh, it still uh, stumps uh, a lot of economists even today, so many years later, they're still arguing as to what really uh, caused it all. But last time we, uh, we ended uh, looking at uh, uh, Larry Spitz and the travails that uh, he went through as a young man, as so many other people did uh, in America. He was not unique at all. But I'd like to start today off with a quotation, and I use a lot of these in my class because I think sometimes when you hear from somebody directly or if you hear from a book, uh, they're able to crystallize things uh, in a way that sometimes uh, we can't always do. And one of the books that I use in my class is called Labor's Untold Story. Uh, it's an ancient classic. Uh, it's been around <laughs> since uh, around the mid-1950s. Uh, I'm sure uh, during the uh, second Red Scare, which we'll see a little later, uh, that that book was uh, very unusual. People did not write about American labor history or American working people. It was left out. American history was about politics. It was about war. It was about wealthy people. The rest of us got left out. I'm going to tell you later how that changes uh, dramatically in a couple of episodes from now. But Labor's Untold Story had a great quote uh, talking about the 1930s and what happened with the New Deal and the labor movement. Uh, the authors said, hundreds of thousands of every age, trade, creed, national origin, and political belief we're coming together to fight the Depression in 1932. It's the first year Roosevelt's in office. As they changed, they changed the country. They transformed America from a place of despair to a country of struggle. They astonished themselves not only by their courage and their militants, but by the swiftness with which they learned throwing away old beliefs and habits which had brought them nothing but disaster. There were times that a man learned more in an hour about what made the world go around than he had learned previously in a lifetime. And boy, you really have to understand the 19... 30s uh, in that era. People really weren't from the 20th century. They were more from the 19th century. They had that Protestant work ethic that 
Any problems were their responsibility. It was their fault. People blame themselves for being out of a job, despite the fact everyone in the neighborhood didn't have a job. It's not the kind of uh, response we have today, and sometimes I think the pendulum uh, goes too far in either direction. Uh, but uh, in those days, they blamed themselves. And there was no way of fighting back until they got over that, but eventually uh, they did. And there were a series of uh, uh, events, some of them even before 1934, where um, usually left-wing groups uh, who had kept their politics together, uh, who knew about fighting back, uh, who organized people in much the same way that the labor movement did. And they had a march on Ford's plant uh, uh, outside of Detroit where several people got shot and, and killed. Um, they uh, uh, had a hunger march on Washington, D.C., led by veterans of World War I. They were the doughboys who had fought that first conflict, who wanted a promised... Uh, bonus, uh, not due until the 1940s. They wanted it then and there because they were uh, desperate uh, for money and for food. But it was 1934 uh, when the world changed. And I always think of Charles Dickens when you, you see uh, uh, Christmas Carol or some of his other works. Uh, it was the best of times and the worst of times. And it's hard for anyone to understand how the 1930s could ever be uh, the best of times, but uh, I only mean that in this respect, that it brought people together. You know, Bob Dylan, for you younger listeners out there, uh, maybe you're not so young if you remember Bob Dylan, uh, but he used to have a saying that uh, when you ain't got nothing, you've got nothing to lose. And I think the American people finally woke up one day and said, we've got nothing left to lose. It's time to fight back and take destiny into our own hands, and we'll do it through the instrumentality of the labor movement, which had almost been fanned out, but they resurrected it. And in 1935, there were five or six major eruptions across the nation, which brought the labor movement back to life in the middle of the Great Depression, uh, one of the greatest uh, uh, comebacks um, never mind American sports history, uh, but certainly uh, in American social history. And the first place was in Toledo uh, in 1934 in Ohio, uh, where the unions employed a mass picket line with 10,000 people in it. What did they have? They didn't have money, but they had people. They had unemployed people. And so they put them on the picket line and helped anyone who went on strike, even in those awful economic times. In Minneapolis, Minnesota in 1934, Jimmy Hoffa, who by, by the way at that time was more to the left than to the right as he was later on in his life, but he would help organize the over-the-road Teamsters, just like the uh, uh, Teamsters around town, um, in a pitched Civil War battle between management and labor that the unions finally won, 1934. And that same year, the longshoremen on the West Coast in San Francisco and uh, Los Angeles and uh, right up the coast into Oregon and, and the state of Washington um, went on strike against the company hiring hall. Because in order to get a job in those days, you had to bring gifts to management. You had to kick back some of the pay that you got. And if they didn't like the way you looked, you never got a job in the first place. Well, a longshoreman hit the bricks. And boy, what a brawl that was. That strike went on for quite a while. Uh, a number of people uh, uh, were shot dead, workers, of course. And no one ever brought to justice for their uh, uh, killings. Uh, and in a mass funeral where 30,000 workers in San Francisco turned out, eyewitnesses say the only thing you could hear, there was no conversation, the only thing you could hear was the soles of people's shoes hitting the cobblestone streets as they paid uh, homage 
uh, to their martyred uh, comrades. And later uh, in 1934, and this one has a strong Rhode Island connection, there was a national textile strike. And the uh, clothing and textile unions were, for the most part, uh, run or uh, heavily uh, uh, weighted at the top by people from Rhode Island because textile was everything here uh, in our state. And uh, people like Tom McMahon and others called a nationwide textile strike on Labor Day 1934. And it started right here in Rhode Island, and it led to uh, a brawl over in Salesville. Uh, some of you know where that is on the Lincoln uh, Central Falls town line. Uh, in fact, the original uh, factory there still has the stanchions for the machine guns that the uh, National Guard took out. And we've got the original film footage of these young working kids uh, in their early 20s uh, fighting back uh, against people who had uh, guns. And uh, at one point, the National Guard chased the strikers uh, into the Mashasic Cemetery, uh, which is right next to the uh, uh, factory, and people hid. Young, young guys in their 20s hid behind headstones in order to take uh, uh, some type of protection against being shot at. And I have to say the Rhode Island Labor History Society, which we started 25 years ago, uh, just two years ago when the 75th anniversary of that strike occurred, we put up a monument uh, and we hold a uh, commemoration there every year for the number of people killed. And I know that right next to the monument itself is a gravestone that's been in there for time immemorial. And through it are two bullet holes. And someone who was there in our first commemoration said, those holes were not made with a pistol. They came either from a rifle, a machine gun, or some other high-powered piece of weaponry. And I can remember speaking there at the dedication and I looked over to my right at that tombstone, and the sun was coming uh, up on that side, and it looked almost like two blazing eyes were looking at the people who did not forget those labor martyrs right in Salesville. And uh, the uh, last uh, episode of 1934, but when they all came together, boy, uh, labor was back on its feet uh, like never before. Uh, in 1934, the Southern Tenant Farmers Union. If you can believe this, 1934, white and black sharecroppers. These were farmers who owned nothing but their labor. They had to rent land, they had to rent tools, they had to buy the seed from the landlords, even down south. But the Southern Tenant Farmers Union organized the white and the black sharecroppers, and they even brought in Jewish lawyers into the South in the 1930s to help them in their union efforts. And I actually got a, a, a newsreel that I show in my class, and I'll tell you it's one of the most frightening uh, things that you'll ever see, uh, to see individuals who could be our relatives fighting to get the right to have a union and getting shot down, not only because of workers coming together, but for black and white people standing together in 1934. It's like looking at a newsreel from another time and space. And I know my students are always stunned uh, when they see that. And so I'm a, I'm a good talker, as you can tell, but when you see that newsreel film footage of your great-grandparents or your grandparents being shot in the back, being beaten by the police, uh, being killed and murdered, and no one ever being uh, prosecuted because of that, let me tell you, that will turn the coldest-hearted person into a pro-labor individual. And uh, that's not my job in life. I just tell the truth. But when you look at American labor history, it's hard. It's hard not to have sympathies for what our ancestors went through and for the tremendous legacy that they left us beginning in the Great Depression in a time when it's hard to believe anyone could fight back. And that's why I'm one of the happiest people you'll ever see, despite the, the way I talk, uh, because I know history, 
And I wake up every morning with a smile because I couldn't be more thankful uh, than anyone else uh, because of what our forebears did for us. So 1934 was the year. It was uh, momentous. Uh, it gave people hope because they had no hope before that. Now they saw they could fight back, they could get benefits, they could get things that they were dying for. And the big move came. Uh, there were so many things in the 30s, I'd be here for a month, and I'm sure you don't uh, want to go through that. But in late 1936, uh, right after Christmas, automobile workers, unionized automobile workers, under the banner of the CIO, the Congress of Industrial Organization, the, the new kid on the block, Unlike the AFL willing to take in skilled and unskilled men and women, ethnic Americans, uh, people of color, it didn't matter. It was the Great Depression and everybody had to sit at the same table. And so they called a strike in Flint, Michigan. Michigan, where you may have read in the paper recently, uh, they've just uh, instituted a, a, a right to work, uh, which I'll go over uh, uh, in, in a future uh, uh, broadcast. But the automobile workers went on strike right after Christmas in 36. The strike went through all of January and almost all of February. The automobile workers took on General Motors, the largest corporation in the world, even in the Great Depression, a billion dollar conglomerate in 1936. Can you imagine that? Ordinary people, our relatives, with blue collars on, took on the greatest behemoth in the industrialized world. And they had a secret, I call it an atomic weapon, the sit-down strike. Instead of leaving the factory, they stayed in and sat there. And their supporters brought them food and clothing. The company couldn't turn the heat of the water off because they would lose their insurance. They called in the National Guard, and I've got newsreel footage of that, with the militia in tanks, with machine guns, and bayonets on the end of their rifles. But the CIO and the automobile workers held fast. They held it all the way into February. John L. Lewis did the negotiations for the CIO, the head of the uh, coal miners union, one of the greatest personalities in all of American uh, labor history. And he took on General Motors. And interestingly, to end up that episode, Governor Frank Murphy, who had been mayor of Detroit, who would later be named to the United States Supreme Court by FDR, tried to mediate the strike, and he had sympathies for working people. But there was so much pressure on the governor, Governor Murphy, that one night, about six or seven weeks into the strike, he knocked at John L. Lewis's hotel room and said, John, you know, I sympathize with you. You know, these are my people, but you can't understand the pressure that I'm under nationally, globally, to call the National Guard, not only in, they were there, to let them loose into the factories. And John L. Lewis, Remember I said this was the age of Freud. He said to Governor Murphy, because he knew all about Governor Murphy, he said, your grandfather was hanged by the neck as an Irish revolutionary, and you didn't fall on your knees to give thanks to the sanctity of the law. Your father was put in prison because of his activities on behalf of a free island. There were no crocodile tears in your eyes at that point. But here, Governor Murphy, you're taking a different stance. He says, tomorrow morning, when you order the National Guard to invade this plant, he said, I'm going to rip open my shirt, and as a bullet pierces my chest and my body falls to the ground below, you listen as your grandfather whispers in your ear, Frank, are you sure you're doing the right thing? John L. Lewis, with a fifth-grade education, turned the governor around. The governor left the hotel room that night, went to the headquarters of General Motors, and said, I will not unleash the National Guard tomorrow. You'll sit down and hash and negotiate with the union, and that's it. Two days later, the automobile workers had a contract. It was one sentence long. 
General Motors agrees to recognize the United Automobile Workers, CIO, as the exclusive bargaining agent for its employees. That was the extent of it. And that was the greatest labor victory in American history. And we'll see how the 1930s play out as time goes by uh, next time. Again, thank you so much, and uh, I hope you're enjoying this. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Labor Vision. We appreciate your input and encourage your comments. Labor Vision can be seen three times each week, Tuesdays at 7 p.m., Thursdays at 8 p.m., and Saturdays at 5 p.m. Tickets to the Providence Newspaper Guild Follies of 2012 are now available. The Follies will take place on Friday, February 22nd at 7 p.m. at the Venus de Milo. Tickets are available by calling 401-421-9466 or going online at www.riguild.org. Over the next several weeks, Labor Vision will host a series of shows that include part two of the Follies. We will have an interview with the President and the Vice President of the Amalgamated Transit Workers Union Division 618. Dr. Scott Malloy will continue his Labor History series and Jim Parisi will continue the regular series on legislative issues in Rhode Island. The Institute for Labor Studies and Research has been approved by the state as a trainer for teacher assistant certification training. Our next class will begin February the 12th. For more information on this statewide certification for teacher assistant certification, contact the Institute at 463-9900.